Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Crowley. Welcome to the Court Achieviat Theatre uh, for a session about how the world is changing, the impact humans are having upon it, and, and how we protect the natural world. So I guess for all of that, we'd need somebody with a global perspective on things, someone who's traveled a fair bit, and luckily, we've got such a person. In fact, this person has been, I think it's safe to say, around the globe more times than most of us have been to France. He is here to share some of his extensive travels across 110 countries, and he's written many, many books, but also, um, you'll have seen on the BBC particularly, his tremendous adventures, his travelogues. He is passionate about wildlife, the environment. So please put your hands together and welcome journalist, author, and television presenter, Simon Reeve. <laughs> I thought what we do is, is I'm going to be so selfish and just ask loads of questions that I've got for Simon, but I would like to open it up. We've got a couple of microphones. We can send them out your way. So if anything comes to mind, you know, hold on to it, and you can hopefully put it to Simon towards the end. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do this with a really broad opening question. I'm sorry, but you know, with okay. all the travels and everything you've been on, and it goes back to meet the stands, doesn't it? We've done, there's been Capricorn and Equator and, and the Tropic of Cancer and Indian Ocean and individual countries like I've been very, Turkey, very Greece, it's all yes. there. Give us a sense, these, maybe these hidden narratives, people we don't hear from, how they say their world is changing as you go around the globe and you meet all these different people. Uh, you start, that's quite tr tricky to we start We haven't got with. long. We yeah, haven't got long. Yeah. I'm going for the kill. Um, do you take flapjacks with you or something like that? That would have been <laughs> an easier start. Um, hello, by the way. Thanks for coming in. Much appreciated. Um, uh, and thank you for the question. I do, I do like it, really. Of course, uh, I would say, in attempting to answer that sophisticated question with a poor answer, um, uh, in the short time I've been travelling extensively, which is, as you say, sort of 13 years ago, I started my humble telly career um, with a series called Meet the Stands, which is where I travel around the Stan countries to the north of uh, Afghanistan, so Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. I'm sure all of you well-traveled individuals have, have uh, followed that path as well. Um, so in that time since then, I've been to something like 100 and 120 countries in total. Um, and yes, I've seen changes in the time I've been traveling. Um, you know, and I think... It's, it, we, we hear a lot about the climate is changing. We hear a lot about the population is increasing. But actually, I think one of the, the biggest uh, uh, responsibilities for me doing the job I do is to try and somehow reflect that to viewers back home. A lot of TV still gives us very beautiful images from the rest of the planet. But when you've got a situation, in my lifetime, the population of India has doubled for example. These are, there are immense changes underway in our lifetimes, on our watch. It's happening to the climate, it's happening to the environment, it's happening to industry. Many people's lives are getting better. There is a cost to that. Those changes are happening. They're happening in a very, very short space of time as well. You think about the great changes that have happened in the history of our species before, over hundreds or thousands of years. Now it's happening in the blink of an eye. That's do, not a great answer, but it's as good as I do can Do people understand it? Because presumably, and I've seen you know, a lot of your work, there are some very vulnerable people out there in terms of vulnerable communities. I'm thinking of reindeer herders, for example, you know, where mm. do they kind of understand what's happening or are they just confronted with this changing picture and they're really struggling to adapt to it? I'd say they're often completely baffled um, by the changes that are happening. So you mentioned reindeer herders. Um, uh, and that's because we had a chat beforehand and I mentioned, uh, Paul Joe is actually about um, 40 people. Um, he's done a lot of research beforehand. It's amazing he's remembering it. We talked briefly uh, about a series I've just been filming. I've been travelling across Russia, um, uh, travelling across Russia for a series about Russia that will be called Russia. <laughs> and it's going to be on TV later this year. And uh, we started in the very far east of Russia, uh, in a place called Kamchatka. I don't know if anybody's been there. Very remote, a real wilderness area of planet Earth. And Russia is enormous, so it still has wildernesses left. But in Kamchatka, we started actually on the top of a volcano three kilometers above the, the um, sea level. Uh, it makes me smile remembering it because it was just incredible. Um, a really glorious, untouched, unspoilt part of the world. But then we helicoptered to some remote reindeer herders. There is a link. 
And those reindeer herders are some of the last remaining nomadic herders um, in, in the whole of Russia, in the whole of the Arctic. And we, I, we stayed with them for a couple of nights. And they were incredible um, characters, really, really tough. Um, folk, uh, but they were saying, you know, there are profound changes underway where we live. Um, and one of them, uh, one of the, Alexander, the main guy, he was saying um, that some of the reindeer in his herd and in other herds of reindeer in, in the Arctic are actually starving to death at the moment, over recent years rather, because uh, they get grass in the summer, but in the winter it's now so much warmer than it should be that rain is falling instead of snow. And the reindeer can't get at the lichen that they need to feed because uh, what was snow before has been turned into compacted ice. So reindeer are starving to death. And he says it in a fairly, uh, in the program, he says it in a fairly, um, uh, yeah, this is what's happening. This is our life. It's tough for us. We don't know if we'll be able to uh, struggle and survive. But this is happening now. And there's no record of this happening before in the oral history of our people. And they you know, they know their history much better than we do. There's not a lot to do around the fire late <laughs> at night. So they talk about the generations past. This is, there he is in the picture. Goodness oh, me. Good timing. What perfectly, well, professional timing that we had there. So that was Alexandra's wife, Galina, who the radio heard us. And I'm hearing this a lot more now in my journeys. And I'm saying it with a smile now. It is a great shock to me. I am hearing indigenous people across planet Earth saying to me, we don't know what is going on, but things are changing profoundly where we live. In Alexander's case, it's that the reindeer are starving to death. Now, this, is, this should not be happening, but it, it speaks of profound things that are happening at the moment, profound changes to our climate. Where do you see your programs fitting into the conversation and the discussion? Because you see this happening, and you're clearly extremely passionate. What do you hope happens after the imaginatively titled Russia <laughs> is broadcast oh, on God, the BBC. It's a, it's a tiny ripple on a pond, really, isn't it? I mean, that's the sad reality. I've worked in other areas of the media, as it were. So I started as uh, you know, a, a post boy and then a cub reporter and an investigator on a newspaper. I've worked for the biggest newspaper, the Sunday Times, biggest newspaper in the country. I've written books that nobody reads. TV has a much stronger, more powerful impact but still, it, you know, I, I, I make programs where we show um, the light and the shade, I would say. We show the glory and we show the problems as well. I know that some people are inspired by what they've seen in the shows I've done, and that's an incredible honour. I've had people come up to me and say, I trained to be a doctor and went off to live in Africa because they, they saw something. I mean, can you imagine the, 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 the honour that is? It makes me feel old, admittedly, but it's an incredible thing to hear. So there is an effect, but there's not profound change. And should there be, is it normal to expect people who watch a TV programme to do what? To change their lives completely? Not, very few of us are behaving immorally. We're doing what any species does. We're trying to give ourselves and our clan a better life, and that's understandable. But personally, I think somebody needs to do the equivalent of stepping in and taking away the punch bowl at the party and saying, all right, everybody, we need to calm down because otherwise we're going to lose control of our planet. And I really think that is a possibility. And it's not, you know, some uh, daft TV presenter saying that. You listen to some of the greatest minds that we have who are really like, there's sort of voice, voices on, in the wilderness saying, look, there is only a 50-50 chance of us surviving this century as a civilizational species. You've got a three-year-old. I've got a six-year-old. This matters in unbelievably profound ways to us and to them. But it matters more to people living on the edge of existence in remote parts of the world where they only just manage to survive. We're pretty comfortable here. It's the tropics that will get hit hardest. That's where we're seeing more extreme weather conditions uh, more deforestation, more pollution, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry to be, I'm not trying to be the harbinger of doom, you know, because there is great beauty out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't hate us for what we are. I love us for what we are. But collectively, obviously, there is a massive impact. And we need a wake up call. And I, and I wonder about the role of television slightly as well, because we absolutely love, and I'm sure I'm speaking to people here, planet Earth and these great spectacles of nature. But do they slightly mislead us? See the lemurs here. All right, you see, maybe yeah. people just saw there were some lemurs there, and then I think, because I know what you're going to say, sorry. Well, uh, do they mislead us that actually the world is wilder and humans have had less of an impact than they really have? Yes, yes, they do. And, and it's a very tricky area, you know, working for the Beeb. 
and, and trying to make programs that are watched by people, but inform accurately and fairly. And the reason I said about the lemurs there is because I sort of get, kind of sort of guess where you were going. And that's a photograph that actually I didn't take that. I shouldn't have put it in. But um, <laughs> Craig, uh, our cameraman, took that shot. He's an amazing photographer as well. When we were filming, traveling around the Indian Ocean for a very good gig I had a few years back, and we traveled to Madagascar, and we went to uh, Berenti in Madagascar. Come on, I know one or two of you will have been there um, because we're all so lucky to be alive now, living when we can go to these places. We went to a, a wildlife reserve called Berenti, in Madagascar, home of the lemurs, an, inc an utterly intoxicating uh, island and place to visit, but which has really been hammered by the impact of us collectively. And you look at some TV series and they will make it look as though Madagascar is still paradise and wilderness. And the reality is we were filming in a small reserve. I don't know if anybody saw it on the TV. We did talk about it in, in my show, in my show, our show. Um, <laughs> I'm the only one who does it, you know. Um, so we went to this reserve, and it's a small reserve where it turned out all the TV uh, crews that have filmed in Madagascar and have filmed lemurs, they all go to that spot. They all film the lemurs inside this small reserve, and they never show the thousands of acres of deforested land just outside that have been turned, ironically, into a sizal plantation a massive industrial sizal plantation to produce eco-friendly packaging for German consumers. And it's got the hairs, a lot of things make the hairs on my arm go up, but it, it, just remembering it and being there, the, the, the sort of failing, I feel, of telly to accurately show the reality of seven billion of us on our planet is, is, is a great concern. There are very few wilderness areas left in our world. Often, uh, you know, there's a lot of wildlife docks where, where the, the brief for them is to, is to give you something that looks glorious. And I understand there's a need for that, because unless you love something, you won't care, we collectively won't care about it. So I understand that's important, but it's the, the context is so vital as well, because things are happening on our watch that you need to know about. And we filmed that sizal plantation, partly to be cheeky, but partly just to turn the camera around to show you this is the reality out there. And I, I think... That, that's it, in fact. That is the size of plantation. Me looking smugly annoyed there about it. But you can see it stretches to the horizon. And, and that was the reality there, that um, so much of it had been lost. And I think, you know, there are... There, that's in Indonesia, in Borneo, that's deforested land. There's a, you can't really see it, but there's an orang there that's lost its family. That's a... Or just talk about the photos, couldn't I? Sorry. I take it you can see these. Yeah, good. They're a bit reflective, I know, but yeah. there's four screens around, so hopefully few, you can just few. about like, What is he uh, talking about? Um, anyway, so yeah, there, there is wilderness still out there. It is few and far between. It is shrinking. We need to protect it. We need to get to the barricades to protect it, quite frankly. And I ask about that then, because um, these reserves, how effective are they when they do exist, you know, regardless of the plantations just outside where it's been deforested? And, and what can people do, you know, in terms of travelling the planet, in terms of going to these places? How yeah. can they support the right kind of conservation? Oh, goodness. I'm just uh, I'm feeling like I'm not going to be able to give ju do justice to the question. OK, d pick me up on stuff I don't answer. But um, uh, I've forgotten the first bit already. because How effective are these thing. reserves? How effective? OK, so for me, these reserves are are utterly critical. I, I think they're more than reserves now. I, I talk about them as being wildlife arcs because I think they're, they are a last serious chance of protecting iconic life on this, on this planet. Um, I'm talking about the great national parks of Africa and Asia, but also the marine protected areas and marine sanctuaries in our seas, which are like national parks in the ocean. And it's, it's so fundamental to... Um, the future for us collectively to not be the generations that wiped it all out, but to, to hold the line and, and protect it. Some of the um, African national parks now are being fenced. And that is not to keep those animals in, it is to keep us out. Because we are, from all sides, encroaching on the parks, nibbling away at them, our, our poor relatives on this planet, to get some farmland for their to feed their families or for another eco-resort, whatever it is, you know, this is happening. So they're absolutely vital. When they're run properly, they are, they are completely, utterly vital 
frost protecting ellies and the big five and orangutans and everything that we know and love about the natural world, all the different elements in the chain. And in our oceans, they hopefully protect our fish from being fished to annihilation. How can we help? That was the second part. <laughs> yeah, very good. I'm getting middle Asian, it's, I'm getting a bit forgetful. But okay, how can we? we there is something absolutely fundamental we can do. Because money's important here, isn't it? It, it, the heart it of all really of this. is. It really is. Um, it's money, but it's also intent. And it's the value that we put on things. So I used to think, perhaps before I started traveling quite so much, and perhaps there's a hypocrisy involved, but honestly, I don't think there is. I used to think the negatives of travel outweighed the positives, that the impact we have is too great. But I really, my view has really fundamentally changed on that because I've seen the good that travel does, not just for us individually, which of course I think it's an extraordinary time to be traveling, it's the golden age, but for what we can do for the environments, the ecosystems, the people that we, that we travel to and the places that we visit, it's really critical. When we go to somewhere glorious in the Indian Ocean, in Africa, in South America, Asia, and we visit uh, Tanjung Puting National Park in Borneo, which I have been lucky enough to do, and I'm sure a few of you have as well, where the orangutans still survive. We pay an entrance fee, and that... If I wag my finger, sorry, you tell me off. If, and that entrance fee, it pays to keep the park going. It pays the uh, gamekeeper, gamekeepers. It pays the wardens. It pays for the petrol in the patrol boat that looks for the Taiwanese industrial fishing boat. boat. It, it protects these environments for the future. So our presence there is utterly critical. So when you're looking through the lovely brochures for these glorious places, don't get sucked into just lying horizontal by the pool. Get up and get out there and go and visit these incredible parks. Go and scuba in the sea and do something memorable and extraordinary, but keep these places going as well as a result. It's something really, really helpful and power powerful we can do for the environment. And then what we're doing for the people who live there is giving them an economic incentive to protect these places. I know you're all far too intelligent for me to be patronising you like that, sorry, but you know, just remind other people as well, it's really critical. Our money matters, not just sending it from overseas, but actually going there, having the experience, falling in love with the place, caring about it, fighting for it and paying for it. And there's an awful lot we can do at home as well. It always strikes me that we're, we're very quick to talk about what African countries should be doing and yeah. how they should be looking after things. Yeah. But we're not saints in the UK. You know, I'm, the, the example that I, is dear to my heart is that there is very few wild salmon left, for example, going up the, the west coast of Scotland. And yeah. there's a potential link there, alleged link. I don't know where it stands legally, so I'm being very careful, with salmon farming. I think you, you know, can be a bit more, you know, point. But anyway, yeah. Okay, I'll let You're you do right. that. I'll I'm let sure you there's no lawyers I'll here. let you do yeah. the yeah. wagging finger, <laughs> and I'll just put the questions forward. But uh, we've got choices to make at home yeah. if we're really valuing the natural world, haven't we? Well, I think we've got... Well, for a start, we've got to, um, we've got to show that we, if we, we can do it, so other people can have a go as well. Fundamentally, you're absolutely right. We are... Um, I think we're pretty hypocritical, frankly. We chopped down our great forests hundreds of years ago. We annihilated the most interesting creatures that existed in these islands hundreds of years ago. Now we say to poor folk in the so-called developing world, you know, really, why can't you learn to live with that elephant that's rampaging through your field? I've got a family to feed, he, say, he and she are saying. You know, they've got, they need to be given economic incentives to protect that, and that's why us caring by visiting, etc. What can we do here? I think we can start by recognising that having large creatures, in interesting animals in our own ecosystem makes life more interesting for us, who wants to live in an environment where there, where there isn't, where the most interesting creature is a cat? I love them, before you, before you chuck things. I don't. But, no, no, <laughs> you know, we still need, we need interesting life in every, in every form, in every way on these islands as well. So for good, let's support the idea of reintroducing beavers and wolves and everything that used to be here and we killed off. Let's do it sensibly, intelligently. Let's, let's pay farmers when they take a, when they take a lamb. But let's, let's do it because it makes life more interesting. Mm. It really does. And I, I can't bear the... the, the I think the, the, one of the worst things about the way, we, the way we live now is how bland the lives that we're... Lead, that we're head, the direction of travel is towards bland, blandness. And that is... 
it's terrible for us. We're the most interesting creature that's ever existed. And, and, we, and we need to live in an interesting environment that makes us feel alive, for goodness sake. I have heard the howl of a wolf. I have heard the pant of a lion outside a lion-proof tent in the Kalahari <laughs> Desert. And it is a tingling sensation that makes you feel completely awake and alive and like you want to live. And that's a really powerful thing. So let's bring the lions back to, to the, the home count. Uh, well, we've got lynxes, haven't we? We've got lynxes being reintroduced. We, we absolutely If anyone's involved in this. that, I mean, Simon lives in Devon. It sounds like he's volunteering his back garden to be the starting <laughs> point, maybe the release it's, it's, station. Yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? Because I probably, well, I have got a six-year-old, you know. But no, we've got to carve out the space yeah. to make it possible. We really do. And, you know, we, we talk about, in Norway now, um, one of the richest countries on, on the richest country in the world, really. Um, terrible reputation for uh, for uh, producing oil, of course, uh, and, uh, and then they um, and then they uh, have this very green image on the back of the oil money. But you know they can't put up with what is it, 35 wolves that they've got, and they're now saying we're going to have to shoot some of them. I mean, how can we lecture other countries when that's how what, what Europe does? So, you know, countries like Turkey, I've seen some great. Um, uh, conservation projects in Turkey. I've just been in... What was that uh, programme called, where you went there? It was called Turkey. Oh, OK, sorry, yeah. OK, just yeah, checking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh. That's what it says on the tin, you know. Uh, Russia, um, for all the criticism that's levelled at Russia, and most of it is entirely appropriate, um, they've really worked to conserve their most iconic creature, the, the, the Amur tiger, the Siberian tiger. And that's partly down to President Putin, actually, who has basically said he's going to remove pieces of any official who doesn't adequately protect them and put the fear of God into them. And now their numbers are slowly but steadily increasing, thank goodness. That's interesting, because we do have to talk about the success stories. I mean, it, Sorry, yes. you have to cling on to that, don't you? Because yeah. uh, it all seems quite bleak with temperatures rising and, and, and yeah. natural species in decline. There are some, some hopeful stories. You know, it is quite bleak, <laughs> in yeah. truth. Um, yes, though, we can make a difference. You know, we can, there are things we could do um, uh, that would profoundly help situations. I think we first have to have, I think the biggest thing we have to do in some ways is we have to have some sort of philosophical discussion, really, about what is our priority. Two of the, uh, I'm coming at this in a slightly convoluted way, sorry, but one of the great challenges for the conservation movement in this century, apart from climate change, which is, which is the, by far the biggest issue, but we also have to talk about what is our priority? Is it protecting uh, iconic animals or is it making poor people richer? So do we, are we lifting poor people out of poverty or are we protecting the environment? Because in most parts of the planet, you cannot do both. They're, you make the poor folk wealthier, they nibble away at the habitat of elephants or tigers or whatever, or the, you know, the tiny bugs that we, we should care about as well that are in the food chain. So it's a really, it's a really complex situation and scenario. I love both, and that makes me quite conflicted. I'm not misanthropic and think, oh, you know, let's get rid of all those poor people. They're amazing as well, but we've got to find a way of both being able to survive and endure. And the challenge is immense. I have seen positive... Um, case studies, if you like. Um, I worked a little bit or filmed. I didn't work with them. What am I saying? Um, I just stood there and took pictures and talked about them. But there's a, a group called Blue Ventures that um, operates. I don't know if anyone's been uh, away with them, but they're a, uh, a scientific research adventure holiday company. They do brilliant work. They're led by a young man, youngish man compared to about your age, um, uh, who studied at Oxford, who's a very inspiring leader. Uh, and he works in, Alistair Harris, he works in uh, Belize, I think, but in Madagascar, I met them. And they took a very holistic approach to the communities they were working in. They realized that the Vaso people along the coast of Madagascar were having eight children each. This is, just, this is them! Goodness me! That's a shot of one of the Vaso fishermen. Oh, this is, we are so professional here. Um, and... Uh, 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 they realized they were, they were breeding uh, dramatically and they were all losing their fishing grounds. So they, one of the things they did, which was very different as a conservation movement, they brought in a family planning boat called the Captain Condom uh, Canoe. Yes. And they traveled up and down the coast of Madagascar um, giving family planning advice. And people were desperate for it, the, the family planning advice. And, um, and that has helped <laughs> to restore a degree of balance to the communities there. 
And so by doing that, the, the ocean is not fished to death as much in that, in that area, and it's making a, a difference. I, th I think if there's one thing we need, it is leadership. Whether at a local level, like Alastair in Madagascar, at a national, international, global level, we just don't have the, the forward thinkers, the deep thinkers that I think we used to, who could say, look, <laughs> we've got to stop. I'm going to make things, I, I know this is a democracy, but I'm going to do something that you're not going to like that much. And I think we're not going to get that, but that is probably what we need. We need to be rolled back a bit in our consumption and, and the dramatic nature of our lives. This is like, a, I'm seeing the pictures here, and they're all quite emotional for me to see, because um, they're all quite extraordinary situations I've found, my, bizarre <coughs> situations I've found myself in. So we need We're, some good leaders. We need someone travelled around the world, you know, who's got a great perspective on things, who... No, we, we don't need any more teleponces. We really don't, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, look, um, I've rattled on for long enough. Uh, that means with my I have too much, was, sorry. No, 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 that was great. Um, let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, get some questions over here. We've got a lady just in the middle there. If we can get a microphone across. And another one there, if we can get the second microphone across the back. Second mic. Thank you very much for the arms going up and the delivery of mics. Hello. Hello. Um, if you had to talk to a room full of climate change deniers, what's the key thing you'd say to them? <laughs> Uh, did you hear that if I had to talk to you in a room full of climate change deniers? I, the thing I say is, how could we not be changing our planet? We are the most extraordinary transformational species that has existed in 4.6 billion years. We are an incredible thing. What, I mean, to my mate, what's in here? We know of nothing like it anywhere in our known universe. In universe. So um, I would say, how could we not be having a profound, making a profound difference to our, our world? Now, is it going to be simplistic? No, I don't think it is. I don't think the changes we're making are going to... It's not necessarily going to be like this on a graph. It's, it's more extreme. What I'm hearing endlessly from people who you're seeing in these pictures is that their world is becoming more unpredictable. So... There's a, if I see it, I'll say, but there's a shot in here of me with the Kogi people, who some people, some think are the inspiration for the tribe in the movie Avatar. They're incredibly connected with their environment. They live in the Sierra Nevada mountains of Colombia. Um, they are a very spiritual people with an incredible uh, history and lineage. They're the only, the most intact surviving civilization from before uh, contact with Europeans. They know something's happening that is changing their world. Insects are flying at altitudes they've never been. Um, mountain tops are melting. Rivers aren't running. Um, their, their little crops are not growing. They're, they said to me, what is happening? What is going on to our world? Uh, in our world, what are you doing to it? And they know that we, the outside world, are making changes. So I'm hearing this in every part of the world I go to. Ali the lion, I saw a shot of him who's a Bedouin leader in the southern Egyptian desert. Um, the Evan people in remoter cold parts of, of Russia, um, the Kogi people, um, endless numbers of, of communities are, are saying things are changing. So it's not just scientists, and I, I would say, to, to come back, how could we not? You know, it's as simple as that, I think. Um, I'm, I'm desperate to add in other stuff. You know, just travelling in Russia now, um, one of the fascinating things for me is a quarter... Uh, at least a quarter of the trees on planet Earth are in Russia. And the largest deforesting hairs on the island, I didn't know that before we started researching this, but the largest hidden deforestation in the world is underway in Russia now, um, where, again, a forest the size of Wales is being taken out each year. And, you know, you think of a back garden, and if you take out one elephant from that, things change. That's what we're doing on a planetary scale, so it has, it has to alter things. And that's, I mean, when talking about that change, you were saying earlier about you know, people going and supporting gate fees for conservation zones. Actually, we need much bigger thinking, don't we? Because we need some sort of money available to, to, to counter big interests. You know, as the world gets more populated, going after natural resources yeah. or whatever it is to protect some of these zones. It's got to be bigger than just gate yeah, fees I mean, the, and conservation zones. Yeah, the, the danger is we think not, u that not using plastic bags is, you know, is going to make some profound that everything's going to change as a result of that. And, of course, it's, it's really not. It's a tiny step, but useful. But 
Um, you know, I think, yes, absolutely. I, the thing we need more than anything, for me, from my little perspective, sorry, I've got the mic so I get to say it, but I think long-term thinking is what we really need. And we need some way of it not just being thinking, but enforced. So somebody needs to be projecting forward. You know, and I can come out with some hippie stuff about how Native Americans used to think on a seventh generation cycle. They would think about the impact of their actions seven, seven generations down the line. And that was how they effectively managed um, the their, uh, uh, buffalo stocks, for example, as they moved with them and herding them. So they would think about that. We've stopped that. We're sort of like this. And there will be enormous consequences, and those we're, we're experiencing already, I think. The image that always pops into my head that scares the proverbial out of me, sorry, Joe, uh, is uh, uh, there's that First World War um, poster, a sort of Kitchener-type poster, where kids sitting on Dad's knee saying, what did you do in the war, Daddy? Oh, it gets me, because I think, you know, what's our, what are our children and grandchildren going to say to us? If, if they realize what, what, what's happening on our, on our watch. But, you know, it's, it's, it's way beyond us. It's a planetary thing. But we can all help and make a difference. And then we've got something at least to say to our grandchildren. We tried. You know? Thank you for the question. Sorry uh, for that. So there was a question. Uh, we had... Uh, there was a lady there. Oh, you've got, got the microphone mic. already. Brilliant. Thank you. And we'll get one. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, actually, I completely agree with you about glossy programs. Because... Um, I think people feel helpless, you know. I think you'd like to know what you could do to help. And I think if there was a program that covered, you know, kind of, you know, forests that are disappearing and animals that are dying out, because I sign endless petitions about these things. Yeah. I think if, you know, if there was a program that actually highlighted these things on a regular basis, I think people would feel more involved and, you know, it would, it would help. But who'd present such a thing? <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> he's, he's, he's helping me out with a future gig, maybe, and that's appreciated. Cheers. <laughs> um, no, I agree. I think, you're, you're, uh, sadly, however, I would suspect you're in a, a, a sizable minority. Uh, and generally, um, the, you know, we, we're pretty good at tracking uh, or knowing what people like and don't like in TV programs because we, you know, we know every 15 minutes when people are five minutes, in fact, when people are tuning in and tuning off. And, you know, I know that if I do something about child labour, for example, in one of my programmes, as I have, we're going to lose 400, 450,000 viewers at that point because people, not everybody can deal with the darkness. But I think if it's done in a way that does show people the reality where it's, you know, it's essential, you know, child labour is often something that, a fam that those children need, otherwise they're going to starve. They don't have a welfare state in, in most countries where they have child labour. Um, not to support it, but just to explain there's nuance. Um, so, yeah, I think there are ways of explaining it. The BBC's banned from campaigning. So it's a charter point that the BBC can't campaign. And, and there have been times when we've got into, we, when the BBC's got into hot water for even pushing charities too, too heavily in, in programmes. We try and make people aware of positive stories when we find them. We show the, I mean, I, I try and show the counterintuitive stuff. So when there's, in a glossy, sunny place, I'll try and maybe show you a bit of darkness in somewhere like Haiti, which people have think is a, uh, you know, is a dangerous, terrifying place. I'm going to try and show you some glory there. But we'll always give you the details. And a quick, a quick search using a popular search engine will turn, up, will turn up more information. So there is loads we can do. And I think when we're away visiting places like that, just don't turn the head from it. I know you wouldn't, but don't, it's, welcome it as part of a more re an enriching experience and a more rewarding adventure. You know, understanding a place means you love it, you love it more. Yeah. So many things I'd love to say, but I know I've got to shut up. Sorry. Let's, let's come down here on the front row. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, no, it's good to see your passion and to hear your voice because it's really very important to engage people. Having been listening to lots of lectures at Oxford Science Week and Green Week and Cheltenham Science Week, um, I then realised I was staying into the jaws of hell, really, because it said next few decades. Yeah. We haven't got centuries, and I've got children and grandchildren, same yeah. concern. So Tony Juniper... A climatologist wrote this lady book, Ladybird Book of Climate Change with mm. Emily Shukbra, Antarctic Polar Explorer, yeah. funded by Prince of Wales. That is quite a clear directive for people if they're interested, like no fossil fuels. A good, a good plug for, their, for <laughs> the book yes. there. Yeah, yeah, because it does give a No clear financial interest in no no no, 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 no. I bought two copies. Oh, oh that's good. <laughs> um, but that sort of thing gives people a clear guidance and the fact we mustn't rely on fossil fuels or plastics 
We can make a huge difference. How you spend your money, you brought that in. Yeah. By supporting things like organic farming, which supports biodiversity. Yeah. Or definitely buying there's, locally, there's, or no. there's loads we we so can we do. So we can do a lot. I don't think people realise how much they collectively can do. we could do more. I think yes. per personally, I feel like. Um, making it voluntary for us is not enough. I think it should be enforced on us to a certain degree. Um, and you know, I think that we've had de you know, the European Union, for example, had decades to impose um, uh, uh, not just not just encouraging us, not just nudging us, but forcing us to live lives that are more sustainable, where uh, next generations would have the benefits that we have. And I think, I, I personally, I think the politicians have really let us down, and they've let future generations down but it's a democracy so it's not just the politicians it's us of course um, but yes there's loads we can do you mentioned plastic plastic is another astonishingly important issue that is not still getting the attention it deserves because we're pouring about 100 million at least 100 million tons of plastic into our seas every year now and it's, a, it's going up exponentially and people think oh well maybe engineering and science in the future will be able to fix this what if they can't? You know, most of it is way out of reach. When you hear about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that's just stuff that's floating on the surface. Most of it is down in the deep depths of our ocean, and it's being gobbled up. We all know it's becoming part of the food chain. And again, I'm seeing that everywhere I go now. So beaches are turning, beaches are turning plastic, for goodness sake. And yet nobody's saying, OK, we need to not just extract plastic bags from the system, but we need to have another go. But we want them. Well, I think we're going to bring someone else in. Sorry, I'm sorry, but we're nearly out of time. And I so should stop as well. Uh, anyway, you get the no, point. <laughs> uh, let's okay. wean ourselves off yes, plastic sir, as well. Thanks. We both felt we couldn't come out here with plastic bottles and we had to bring virtue signaling, no doubt. But anyway, sorry, sir. I know I'm very controversial, but uh, will you have a word with Trumpity Trump? But let him into the secret, please. Will I do what? Will I have a word have a with word Trump? Trumpity Trump. Will I Trump Trump? Dump Trump. Well, I'll certainly have a word if I can get past his security guards. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we tried to get a little bit too close to uh, Vladimir Putin. That was a scary enough experience. But um, the US Secret Service does have a bit of a reputation, doesn't it? But yeah, I mean, the, the, these people, these, they, they, they are the gods of our modern world. And, and, and although elements hold their power in check, obviously they could make profound and massive, massive differences. But once you... St I think, the, you know, I've met a lot of politicians who are... Um, who have best, you know, they're, they're caring, sharing people, but as they ascend that pole, sort of those elements seem to fall away, and the, the, the power, power does strange things to people, doesn't it? It focuses them perhaps in not quite the direction that we collectively need. He's going to have another go as well, look. I like the conversation. Sorry, Joe. No, once they have the steering wheel, unfortunately, uh, everything changes. Could have put it there. Well, look, I'm afraid we've run way over, oh, so we're sorry, going to have to sorry. end there. But, um, I mean, it's amazing to see Simon's passion. Um, I think uh, there's a lot for us all to think about there. Is there a tour coming up I saw on a website? I'll do you that <laughs> favour. I'll give you a play. If people want to see more, hear more. Thank you very much, Joe. I'll give you the tenner later. No, five won't do for that. Yes, Joe, I am doing a little tour. Goodness me. Um, I can't believe it. Yes. I'm doing a tour next year, in fact. I, I, I've, I've never done anything like it. It's probably going to be a disaster. Uh, it'll just be my family in the audience. But um, uh, I see the You've venue got a big numbers, family here today, yeah. The venue numbers seem to have increased astonishingly. It's being run by the guy called Giles. He's the chairman of the Royal Variety Show. So he must know what he's doing, surely. Are you taking I your tap shoes? Is it you know, a complete performance then? One man band, yeah, banjo. Yes, Good. exactly. And Russia, um, when's that going to be on? Russia is on uh, probably September, October. They don't tell us, but it has to go out then, really, because it's tied to the anniversary of the revolution. So I've done the first vo the vo the, the, the voiceover for the first program on Friday. I've got a couple more to do. So three part series. Three part series, journey across Russia, country. We really do need to know about and keep an eye on. A few of these pictures are from there. In fact, that's looking for tigers at night. Not a wise thing to do. <laughs> a Siberian tiger. Teeth to tail, half the length of a London bus. Ooh, there's a thought to Biggest big on. cat on the planet. We want them, don't we? We need to keep them. There's some smaller ones. Well, look, anyway, ladies sorry. and gentlemen, wonderful passion there. Please put your hands together. And for, for Joe as well. Somebody's working really hard here. <laughs>